Hi, this is Angelo John Lewis for the Diversity and Spirituality Network podcast, and I'm here interviewing my old colleague, Tom Crottenmaker, who's a writer specializing in religion in public life. Tom is the author of a recently published book, Confessions of a Secular Jesus Follower, and he's written widely about religion. His first book, Onward Christian Athletes, examined Christianity in professional sports, his second book, The Evangelicals You Don't Know About the New Evangelicals in Post-Christian America, was a winner in the Best Books competition in the Religion Newswriters Association. Tom writes regularly for the USA Today's op-ed page, and he's also appeared in publications like the Washington Post's Religious News Service and the Huffington Post, among other media outlets. Tom also has a day job as communications director for the Yale Divinity School. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on, Angelo. It's fantastic to be crossing paths with you again <laughs> after all these years. Tom, you know, I get by the title of your book and the excerpts I've read of it that you identify yourself as a secular Jesus follower. But why don't you start by telling me a little bit about your early religious or spiritual upbringing? I just want to point out that secular Jesus follower is not exactly an established category. Just want to acknowledge that. It's um, some language I've come up with to describe my own path. And I meet people all the time who say, well, yeah, that's actually me too. But it's not ex if you look at the religious affiliation da data in the different categories, secular Jesus follower is not one of them. Just acknowledging that. I think they'd put you under secular, not religious, or something. Spiritual, but not religious. That's what, that's what they'd call you. Probably. But going to your question, I was raised in a nominally Catholic family. My mother dutifully dragged my sisters and me to Mass on Sundays. And I did some of the Catholic education things that kids do growing up in the Catholic Church. But it, also, it always felt like we were sort of going through the motions or doing it from a sense of obligation. And my sisters and I faded away from it when we became of age. And I know that my mom stopped attending once we were out of the nest. For a while, when I was an undergraduate, I was going through this period where I was attending Campus Crusade for Christ events. I had my evangelical dalliance for this one year. But that really never took Angelo, and I faded away from that. And then through much of my adult life, I faded farther and farther from organized religion, as we'll probably discuss at some point in this conversation, I did resume a different kind of engagement with religion as a journalist, as a writer. But I'm at the point now in my life where I've drifted away from organized religion, from church attendance, from prayer and belief and all the things that sort of define one as a, as a religious person or as a church person. Yet, as you have noticed, I still maintain a very keen interest in religion, and I think it's a really important topic, and I'm on a sort of related but different spiritual quest now as someone who's involved in humanism. It calls to mind the question that you're, I guess you would call yourself a non-believer in the religious sense, but yet you're very attracted to religion. What, what, what accounts for that? I think religion is really important, and if somebody wants to understand what's going on in politics in our country today, what's going on in culture. And for that matter, if you want to understand art and literature, you really see that religion is important. Christianity, Christianity in particular, also Judaism and um, other religions that we have in the United States now. And so my interest is in part journalistic. I was a newspaper reporter before I started working in the um, higher ed sector. And I still have a sense for, you know, an attraction to what's a big story. And for many years now, I've sensed that religion is a big story. And there are lots of really interesting, important, unresolved issues that are um, ongoing grist for media coverage. 
and I've been attracted to them. I wanted to understand them and write about them and try to help find a way toward reconciliation or at least understanding around them. So that's been part of it. But it's personal too, Angelo. I'm really interested in the questions that religion brings up and in the answers that religion attempts to bring forward and trying to apply them to my own life in a way that works for me, which is, of course, a more secular way. I'm interested in things having to do with meaning and what constitutes a life well lived, what gives our life shape and purpose, and what can we do that helps us get outside of our own mundane, self-centric existences to something that's broader and more edifying. And I think religion at least provides some cues in some directions, even if we don't accept the um, answers verbatim. So these are the things that draw me to religion and to its cousin, uh, humanism. So what is it that attracts you to Jesus in particular? I mean, is it simply that you were raised in a Christian culture? I mean, there's obviously these other religious icons that you could choose to emulate, but there's something sure, about I, Jesus that attracts you. Sure. And I have read a few books about Muhammad and Buddha, and I have learned things about those figures that I find really edifying and important. And I've taken some cues from those figures. And there are many others in the pantheon of philosophers and teachers and moral exemplars. Martin Luther King Jr. is another one who's really inspired me and who I've read about. That said, for me, the figure of Jesus is especially compelling. I acknowledge that this is probably due to familiarity, you know, having to do with the time and place in which I've grown up and lived. I mean, growing up in the United States in the 60s and 70s, as I did, you're bound to be immersed in Jesus things, even if you're not a particularly strong church person. So familiarity is part of it. Jesus is the figure who I know the most about and who I've read the most about, heard the most about, had the most conversations about. But um, I would wager, I would say that it's more than just familiarity, Angelo. Having given this a lot of thought and research, there are things about Jesus that really stand out for me and that make me say that, at least for me, Jesus, it, the figure of Jesus is special. Well, tell me about those. There's some, are there particular aspects of his teachings that are important to you? And uh, I guess the follow-up would be, how do you attempt to put these into practice in your life? So the, uh, the body of teachings about Jesus and from Jesus is really robust and well-rounded. And it's not just the variety of issues that are tackled, but also the way that these are tackled. With uh, the Jesus of the New Testament, you get some didactic teachings about what life is about, how to live, how to treat people. But you also get stories that are incredibly rich and evocative. You know, for some people, reading dry recitations of philosophy, that's all they need. And that can, you know, inform them in powerful ways. But others, including me, are really open to stories. And stories are what really can move us and teach us. And the stories about Jesus and the stories that Jesus tells in the New Testament are oftentimes incredible. And the uh, inspiration and the meaning that we can get from them really stand out. As I'm saying this, I'm thinking about some of my you know, favorite parables about and by Jesus, uh, whether it's the story of the loaves and fishes, the Good Samaritan, the story where he ends up saying that he who is without sin should cast the first stone. These are incredibly rich and so full of meaning. So that's another reason. It's the format that these teachings come in. You talked about the aspects of this that I'm working hardest to implement into my own life. Um, a lot of it goes back to how we treat other people. In particular, the people who have the least amount of status and privilege, particularly people who are outcasts. I'm struck by the way Jesus over and over again reaches out to these people who have been dehumanized by situations that exist in their own time. And we have lots of that today. And I find that incredibly inspiring, challenging, and incredibly relevant to so much of what vexes us today. So you have a kind of a... An interesting viewpoint, I guess, to say the least. So it's almost like you're swimming in the sea of re religiosity uh, without being religious. So I'm wondering, first of all, you, you obviously must come in contact in your professional life as a, as a journalist covering these things with a lot of believers. What are those conversations like? Do they I think really that you're weird or what, what, what's, <laughs> what's going on? 
Well, I've been really fortunate to be around a lot of believers, and I've really made it a point to connect with believers. Now, just as a natural course, I would end up gravitating toward more progressive Christians because there's a lot of overlap between my ethics and practices and theirs. But partly because of being inspired by Jesus, I've made it a point to connect with Muslims as well. And back when I was in Portland, which is where I lived until two years ago, I really engaged deeply with the Muslim community there. I became friends with the head of the Muslim Educational Trust, which is the main organization in Portland. I attended a lot of their events. I went out to the school that they ran and talked with the kids and the students a few times. I was a speaker at some of their events. They had me moderate some of the events that they put on. So that was a really enriching experience for me. It was an example of me engaging with my quote-unquote other because uh, Muslim is very foreign to uh, my own experience growing up in the United States and the experiences I've had. And then I extended that to the evangelical Christian community, which is also not my community and which is also very other for me. And that has also been at times challenging and even off-putting, but also uplifting in other ways. So you ask about the, um, the kinds of responses that I get to my own particular, and you might say peculiar path, And this has become a really robust conversation since the publication of Confessions of a Secular Jesus Follower about six months ago. And I'm finding that the reactions can be sort of broken down into um, four categories. Two would have to do with the um, reaction I get from Christians. And then two of the, the other two categories have to do with the reactions I get from atheists and other secular people, including humanists. And it's quite a range, and it's quite fascinating, Angelo. So let's start with um, what I hear from, from Christians. There are some, including evangelicals, who love what I'm doing. And even though I'm not a typical believer, they think it's awesome that this um, non-believer sees what's great about Jesus and is taking Jesus seriously, applying Jesus to his life and finding ways of talking about Jesus that are really helpful, you know, updated ways of talking about Jesus that can make um, his teachings and his example more accessible in this particular time that we live in right now in the United States. So they love what I'm doing. But Angela, then there are others who really do not accept it at all. I was listening to a conservative Christian radio program, and they were using words like um, cancer and poison when they were talking about my book and this notion of someone um, following Jesus without being you know, conventionally Christian. And um, I know that there are others who find it to be um, perhaps threatening to um, institutional religious organizations. And then there are others who just think it's completely illegitimate. They say that you can't separate Jesus from from religion and that what I'm doing is like an act of radical decontextualization to the point where they just can't wrap their head around it and accept it. So those are the two responses from sort of the um, Christian community. And then uh, if you look at what's happening on the secular side of the tracks, I guess there are some parallels. There are some who uh, reject what I'm doing for reasons that may sound familiar When you think about what I said with regard to um, some traditional Christian people, there are some secular people who find that Jesus is so inextricably bound up in religion and Christianity that it's like crazy or impossible for a secular person to engage with this figure and learn from this figure and go so far as to say that they're following this figure. But then I found there are others, too, who actually resonate with what I'm doing. I'm thinking about this one um, really adamant atheist who I know who writes book reviews and does other forms of writing. And Angelo, when he told me that he was going to review my book, I'm thinking, oh my God, this is going to be so negative. (laughs) But then when he read the book, he um, saw that the values and the ethics that I was surfacing through the figure of Jesus were values and ethics that he found really important and positive and that resonated with him. And so he sort of warmed up to it. I mean, he's not going around declaring himself to be a secular Jesus follower. But he ended up being positive about the book because he found that the the values that I'm promoting and seeing in Jesus are so helpful. And in his view, so um, resonant with um, humanistic values and humane values. So there's sort of your diagram about the kinds of reactions I'm getting. (laughs) The thing that strikes me, Tom, is that the people that are uh, religious... I guess I'm thinking about Christians in general. So they live in they live in a context of a community, 
and there are values that the community reinforces for them to put into practice. As a secularist, you don't necessarily have the same type of community. So I guess the question I'm sort of struggling to formulate is that, can you give me some sort of examples as to how you attempt to put some of Jesus' principles into practice? So, I mean, when I think about Christianity, I don't consider myself a Christian either. One of the things I admire about it is the whole idea of charity and reaching out to people that are less less fortunate than, than I am. So I don't do that as well as I could, but I'm just curious as to what your your story is about that. What is your take about that? What, what are the kind of things that you do attempting to put into practice some of the teachings um, of Jesus? I've really doubled or even tripled down in trying to treat everyone the same. Hopefully well, <laughs> but especially those who I could easily get away with mistreating because they would be people with the least amount of status and privilege. You know, I've always been bothered by people who instrumentalize other people and who like really suck up to those who have the most amount of power and status, those who could, um, who I could benefit from knowing, who could maybe help promote my book or advance my career. I mean, it's really easy to be sucked into treating those people the best. And I've known lots of people who do that. And partly because I've been um, inspired by Jesus since my youth. And because I've remembered these teaching, these teachings from Jesus about having to do with the way you regard the least of these as it's put in the Bible. I've always thought that there was something really especially important about that. And uh, in more recent years, as I've gone into this um, idea of being a secular Jesus follower, I really focused on that and tried to um, really be conscious about how I treat people. And I think I've made progress in that. You know, I'm far from perfect. I don't want to be all pious and proud with you and say that, (laughs) you know, I'm just awesome in the way I do that. But I've become really intentional about trying to treat everybody the same and really going out of my way to um, acknowledge and get to know people who have um, the least amount of power and status and privilege. And that's carried over to how I engage with um, African Americans and Muslims, um, people in other minority groups, and trying to understand life from their perspective and um, trying to really see them as fully 100% human human beings, just the same as I am. And this has been really meaningful to me and something I've taken very seriously in my writing, yes, but also in my personal interactions. I could give you other examples, too, having to do with the way I've tried to cope with anxiety and um, the way I've dealt with um, some of these issues around sex in our culture and the way a lot of men mistreat women. Each of the main chapters in my book go into an issue and talk about the ways that I've tried to implement these teachings of Jesus, whether it's... um, from the standpoint of big issues in our country, or whether it's from a personal standpoint. Tom, I, I noticed that um, you don't use the word atheist when you characterize yourself. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, I don't consider myself um, an atheist. There are lots of reasons for that, but um, to me anyway, it implies a, a kind of a, a militancy that I don't have. It can imply um, an anti-religion stance, and I'm just the opposite. In some ways, I'm very pro-religion, I mean, depending on the person or the project or the strain of Christianity or Islam you're talking about, but I can be very pro-religion, and I'm very open to it, and I have lots of friends who are religious, and I work at a re- religious divinity school, so that's these are some of the reasons I don't go with the atheism label, and also um, it implies a kind of certainty, and I'm a lot more humble than that, you know? Um, I'm more agnostic and even a capital A agnostic to the extent that I would say that many of these things about the nature of God are not knowable. It's not just that I don't know, but ultimately they are unknowable. So, um, And I'm also interested more in a positive articulation of secular life. I don't want to spend all my time talking about why religion is wrong or why God doesn't exist. I'm much more interested in engaging this new conversation about what it looks like to live meaningful, deep, secular lives, and secular lives that are of service to our fellow human beings, regardless of where they are in the theological spectrum. That's interesting, because it, when, I, when I look at surveys, I, I think mostly of the Pew Surveys of Religious Life, I, I'm probably misquoting the actual title of it, but I'm sure you're familiar with the survey. Of course. Um, they talk about a 
growing secular humanistic movement. They don't use those terms. Um, but basically, it seems that people that um, call themselves religious, that's, that, that group is in decline. And the secular group seems to be gathering steam. That's true. So, yeah, so um, let's let's talk about the secular the secu- secularism, if you will, and uh, the secular humanistic movement um, sure. in particular. Um, Let me talk now as a journalist who's written a lot about this. I don't want to be too didactic. Okay. But um, what's one of the biggest changes that's happened in our culture over the past twenty years or so has been the very robust growth of this um, sector that you would call religiously unaffiliated or not religious, and Be clear that atheists are only a minority of that group. But we're at the point now where fully 25% of the American public are religiously unaffiliated. They're not churched. They're not attached to any particular religion. Some of them may have some lingering God belief and a lot of spiritual yearnings, but these are the religiously unaffiliated, and they've grown from approximately... 6% a quarter century ago to the point where it's now a quarter of the population. And among younger Americans, it's up to like 40% of the population. And so, but this is one of the most important changes happening demographically in our country over the past quarter century. And this has profound implications. I mean, obviously for churches, because they have a smaller pool of people to attract and serve. But I think it goes well beyond that. It raises profound questions for our society. When you think about all the um, service that churches and church people provide, whether it's hospitals or charities, um, other kinds of nonprofits, and um, this effort to really inculcate positive values in people. So and when you think about these and you think about religion receding, it, it brings forward a really profound question. Like, What's going to fill in where religion is receding? I'm very interested in these questions as a as a writer, as a journalist, but also as a citizen. I mean, it's not all good that religion is receding. You know, far from it. And even though I'm um, somebody who um, is involved now in a humanist community and somebody who's very um, out as a secular person, I'm not going to cheer this decline of religion. It's something that has some negative consequences, partly. And it's something that really puts the onus on non-religious people to step up and do many of the good things that religion has been doing over the centuries. Well, you raise some really interesting points there. A lot of your writing talks about the positive role that religion has in society. So if we have this rising, I'll call it a secular humanist community, what kind of lessons, first of all, might that group learn from religion? And how do you see people putting that into practice? There's a lot to learn. One of my favorite writers and philosophers is Alain Dubaton, someone you may have heard of. He wrote a really important book called Religion for Atheists. And he gave a really important TED Talk a couple of years ago where he calls upon um, the secular community to look closely at the positive things that come from religion and try to emulate these in a secular way. Stuff like ritual and community and intentionally looking at our lives ethically and trying to incorporate these ethics into our lives. And I'm worried that if secular people don't attempt to do these things, there could be a vacuum, not just in society, but in our own lives. You know, there could be a hole in our lives. I'm not going to say that it's going to be an existential crisis for everybody. I'm not contending that there's going to be this like horror show of nihilistic values and nobody having any ethical compass. It's not that at all. It's a lot more subtle than that. But there could be a real problem in our lives and in society. What's heartening to me and what's fascinating to me is I really see that the secular community is getting started in this project, what I call this positive articulation of secular living. And it's really important, Angelo. I mean, up till this point, what the secular community has mainly been known for and mainly focused on has been articulating what's wrong with religion, articulating maybe why we're not religious. It's been focused on maintaining a robust separation of church and state. It's been focused on why uh, scientific 
point of view is so important, why rational thought is so important, and making the case for why these things should drive our decision-making in our lives and as a society. And I do think those things are important, and I'm glad that those projects are being undertaken. But I'm interested in going beyond that and looking at things like meaning and inspiration and ethics and community. I'm involved in a community that's taking these things on. As you probably know, Angelo, I'm involved in the Yale Humanist community, which is almost brand new. It's only been around for a few years. And they're finding that a lot of the um, humanist organizations are also brand new, just getting started. But I think it's an important and positive development, and I'm glad to see us taking these things on. And I, I do want to point out that at the Yale Humanist Community, one of our slogans is that when it comes to being non-religious, what you don't believe is only the starting point. What's much more interesting and important is taking on things like, well, what do we believe and what are we about as human beings? So I'm curious. I'm not cognizant of what goes on in secular humanist communities. So give me some sort of examples, if you will, of some of the projects that these kind of groups take on. I mean, do they engage, for example, in charity work? Or what, what, what sort of things do they do? Obviously, I mean, it sounds very intellectual to me as an outsider. So I'm just wondering some of the things that you do. Uh, just for context, the uh, Yale Humanist Community, which I participate in, it's one of numerous humanist chaplaincies that are popping up at universities. Interesting. Yeah, that are popping up at universities. I'm aware of the humanist chaplaincy at Harvard, for example, at Stanford. There's a new one at the University of Southern California. I just find, I just keep finding out about these seemingly every few weeks. And then there are other um, humanist organizations that are popping up and operating outside of university contexts. So what goes on at the Yale humanist community? We have a uh, a Sunday gathering every other Sunday. It's called Humanist Haven. And you said it sounds intellectual to you, and it is it is intellectual. We usually have um, a speaker talking about some um, ethical issue. A lot of times it seems to intersect with science or neuroscience. They're usually really interesting. What's important, though, is that it doesn't end there at the Yale Humanist community at these Sunday gatherings. After the main talk, we have a chance to ask questions of the speaker, and then uh, we break up into groups of three or four and discuss the issues from the, con- from the standpoint of our own lives and ways that we've grappled with these things in our own lives. And so that makes it a little bit more personal. And then there's a discussion group that we have monthly at the Yale Humanist Community, and it's actually my privilege to host that and lead those discussions. We call it WTF question mark, as in who or what to follow. But obviously that acronym has other meanings. And those other meanings are actually quite appropriate because, you know, we're looking at life's big questions and they can be really challenging. But at those discussion groups, yes, it is intellectual, but I encourage everybody to also look at our own lives when we tackle these ethical questions and, you know, what we're doing to incorporate our philosophies into our lives and where we're succeeding and where we're struggling. So I'm really intent on doing what I can to make sure that, yes, intellectual, but how it applies to our lives personally. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, because what strikes me as attractive and also repellent about religion is things having to do with the supernatural. But to put it even, even using a larger word, which is maybe a little less charged, things having to do with the non-rational aspect of being in the world. And when I talk to a lot of my rationalist friends, it seems that there's no openness to discussing things which cannot be proved empirically. So what is your sense as to how you deal with the non-rational aspects of life and how secularists are doing, doing with that? It won't surprise you to hear that the um, supernatural claims of religion became a bigger and bigger stumbling block for me over the course of my life. I remember, even as a teenager, thinking that the um, supernatural claims of the Catholic Church were just things I couldn't wrap my mind around. I couldn't accept them as true. And for the longest time, that is what drove me away from churches. And in a real way, it um, prevented me from really getting serious about the notion of being a Jesus follower. 
And this was a shame because, as I've mentioned a couple times in our conversation today, I find the Jesus way to be um, incredibly inspiring and instructive, transformative, and relevant to so much of what we struggle with today. So that was really a shame. For me personally, I just came to the point where I decided that I was not going to be stopped by that anymore. I'm not saying that I decided to that I decided to accept the supernatural propositions of religion, but I decided just to set them aside and focus on the parts of the story that I actually could believe and that I did find meaningful. So there's something in that. Um, there are other ways that people try to grapple with um, the supernatural and I'll say non-rational aspects of religion that they can't wrap their minds around. Some people um, turn them into symbols. There are lots of liberal religious people who engage it that way, so they don't just completely set that aside the way I've done, but they've found ways to um, engage these things as symbols and as metaphors. And so that is one very sensible approach to it. And I find myself even doing some of that in my book about ways I found to sort of translate the supernatural and non-rational claims of religion into things that I can wrap my head around. This comes to the fore when you're looking at things about Jesus, for example, such as, for example, the resurrection. You know, what does someone like me make of the resurrection? And I've found a way that works for me. Not everybody buys it, but I would say that I've found a way to come to terms with the supernatural claims of religion such that I'm no longer stopped by them, such that I'm able to pursue the ethics and the example of Jesus in a way that's been meaningful for me. Yeah, I probably should have not have used the word supernatural because it puts a, it puts a different spin on it than what I was attempting to get to. I meant the kind of non-rational aspects of life. So, for example, it seems to me that the thing which dominates everything right now is the is it's, it's almost like the cult of science is the way I, way I look at it. True, true. So unless things can scientism. can can um, yeah scientism, unless things can be put into a test tube and tested in the in the empirical method, it cannot be true. So that's my problem with the sort of the rational framework. I think it has its limits. I do too. I mean, as I uh, told you in our email exchange. And this is um, riffing on um, a phrase that might be familiar to those who are familiar with religion. Humans do not live on rationality alone. I'm not saying we should completely go all in on things that are outright irrational. I'm not saying that at all. But there are certain things that are important to human lives and that are important to me that are neither irrational nor rational. I'm talking about things like love and inspiration. I don't think those can be reduced to science. I'm talking about the effect that we experience as human beings if we hear music that's incredibly evocative and beautiful to us. I'm talking about the um, experience we have when we encounter a story or an example of somebody doing something that's incredibly generous or self-sacrificing and it can be moving and we can feel it in some way. I don't know exactly what the words would be, but to me these are examples of, of things that are beyond science. Um, they're not in opposition to science, but these are other realms of human experience and human existence. And I really want to have these in my life, and I hope that the secular community can have these. Not to toss out science. I think science has so much to offer. But I do reject the philosophy that we might refer to as scientism, where we would claim that science is the only way to try to understand life, and that science has all the answers. That, to me, is too limiting. Tom, this has been a very nurturing conversation for me. I, I, I almost think of you as a kind of a, <laughs> you'll probably reject this term. It's almost like you're like a 21st century uh, religious visionary. <laughs> well, I'm, I have way too negative an opinion about myself to be comfortable with that. So I'll say thank you, but I disagree. <laughs> So for any listeners, can people contact the group that you're involved with? And how would they do, go about doing that? Yeah, it's easy to find information about the Yale Humanist community just by doing a Google search. And uh, to find out more about my USA Today columns 
And my book, it's easy to find me. You can go to TomCrottenMaker.com. Yeah, I know. It's really hard to know how to spell Crottenmaker. I'm not going to spell it now. But maybe if you approximate it, you'll get to the right website. And uh, people can follow me on Twitter, at T. Crottenmaker. I encourage people to sign up for my mailing list to get a notice every time I have a piece coming out. And most of all, go to the website about my book, Confessions of a Secular Jesus Follower. They can find that at secularjesusfollower.com. Wonderful. Tom, thanks very much for for joining me today. And let's be in touch a little bit more than we have been in the last 20 years. (laughs) Let's do that. I hope we can get together in person. And thank you for this conversation today, Angelo. And more important, thanks for the work that you're doing with these podcasts and in the area of spirituality and diversity. It's really important. Thank you, Tom. What is diversity? What is diversity?